to the text I have chosen, Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 9 through 13. I would like us to read them all together. You don't have to stand, but let's read them together. Matthew chapter 13, verses 9 through 13. Everybody has it? Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall receive more in abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. I think it is probably a, a the first and foremost passion that I have is to live life with excellence and make use of every moment of every day, but to pass that message on and to influence other people to understand that we never have more time, we always have less time. I have less time than when I stepped up onto the pulpit, and I have less time than when I just said that. Are you hearing me? And we just seem to take life so casually as though we can do this thing tomorrow. Which tomorrow? You know it wasn't promised to you. Now is the accepted time. Whatever you're going to do, now is the accepted time. I don't care where I'm talking. I don't care where you hear me talk. I am going to mention time. And I'm going to mention the fact that time equals life. There's no casual moment. There's no insignificant thing. Everything I do, I have to use my time. L-I-F-E. That's how I spell time. L-I-F-E. To do it. And when I give of my time, I cannot get it back. So if I am spending my time, investing my time, shouldn't I get something good in return? Because this is my most precious and priceless, irreplaceable resource. Given to me by God. What did he say to the, to, to, the, to, the, to the man who gave back the one talent? Say, well, I know you're a hard task, master. You like to reap where you don't sow. So you give me one, I give you your one back. <laughs> he said, well, you wicked and slothful. What are we doing with our time, with our life? What are we doing to... to, to justify the fact that we call ourselves Christians. How are we different from people at work? How are we making a difference? How are we impressing upon them that the word of God is not only heard by us, but manifested through us in our daily lives? Well, when Jesus came, we see in Matthew chapter 13, that this is the beginning of the announcement and explanation of what the kingdom of heaven will be between the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. All right. My theme for this morning is putting kingdom principles into practice. Putting kingdom principles into practice. When Jesus came, the main thing he came for was to seek and save those that were lost. That was his mission statement. He came to bring salvation, but he also came to establish a new order. How did he say it? A more excellent way. He came to teach, he came to preach, he came to minister, and to give us examples of how to deal with every situation that we are challenged with in life. Every single one. 
However, the principle of free will that was established in the first Adam remained unchanged. And so Jesus would often say, when he finished speaking, he that had ears to hear, let him hear. I can't make you hear. I, I'm going to teach, I'm going to preach, I'm going to minister, but I can't make you accept what I'm giving you. Your free will, given to you by God, has to be used in all occasions and under all circumstances to make choices. And I don't know if you've heard me say this before, but all choices are life and death choices. It's either life you're choosing or you're choosing death. Deuteronomy 30 and 19, Behold, I set before you, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. But choose life so that you and your descendants may live. It isn't just affecting you. Your choice isn't just affecting you. Your choice of action anytime. Anytime affects you and your descendants. So in the text that was read, we see the privileged position of the disciples, the followers of Jesus who believed in his teaching. That means we are disciples, right? We are followers of Jesus who believe in his teaching. So we see the privilege of the disciples in that the disciples were given the privilege of having access to the explanation of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But the ones who chose to retain a hard heart, the ones who came just to hear how he was wrong, to compare what they already knew with what he was saying and say, see, I told you so. He way off base. They, they came with their mind made up. They, were, they didn't come to listen. They didn't come to hear. They, they came to judge and to, to, to assess and to evaluate. Oh, well, he's a good speaker, but he ain't making, he's talking nonsense. Oh, yeah, no, believe you me, all, them, all of those attitudes existed in the time of Christ. They retained a hard heart and refused to listen with an open ear and a receptive mind and therefore would not be able to understand. We who follow Christ, we who are Christians today, are in that same privileged position as the disciples were back then. And we can always go to our Lord and Savior and say, this I do not understand. Please teach me. Please give me a discerning spirit so that I may know what your word is saying to me. In fact, if you're not doing that, you think too much of yourself. I mean, the whole process has to be one of meekness and humility. Where whatever you think it is, you go to God and say, this is what I think it is. But Lord, help me to fully understand the truth of your word. Only the Holy Spirit can guide you to truth. I can be the agent. I can be the vessel. But I can't guide you to truth. I hope you heard me. I flesh cannot guide you to truth. I can be the vessel that points you in the direction. And then you go and work out your own salvation for yourself. So often I see examples of people walking around with a sense of entitlement. <laughs> we take our blessings and provision for granted, you know. Yeah, we're entitled. Not only are we entitled to what we got, but we want more. <laughs> we focus on our rights and privileges. But any question of responsibility is a burden and an afterthought. You know, I tell people in my house, you know, you're walking around, put a smile on your face. Or you, or you want me to give you some of these bills. <laughs> I give you some bills now. Uh, but you ain't paying, put a smile on your face. You're getting provided for, put a smile on your face. It's not going to always go how you want it, but look. <laughs> Y'all feeling me? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? 
You know, and I have to say this to young men and young women who are brought by their parents into my office and they say, Doc, I have a problem with this boy. You know, and then they say, well, she just, I say, no, hold on, hold on a minute. Who are you talking to? She. That's your mother? The one who gave birth to you? I say, when you come in my office, you uh, don't refer to her as she is, or don't come back. And they straighten up. You understand? And they do what's right, and they say, Doc, how you get them to do that? I say, the same way you could get them to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Refuse to accept foolishness. Yeah. <laughs> it's a matter of respect. That mother, nobody has relationship with you like your mother. Nine months before your father knew you, your mother knew you. <laughs> she presented you to him and said, okay, now you can play with him. All right, <laughs> but before then, it was just you and her. Nobody knows you as long as your mother knows you. Are you uh, do you think about that? There's an intimacy of connection with the person who has given life to you and, and, and given birth to you that um, fathers cannot have. In fact, let me say this now, put a smile on your face. <laughs> You're waiting for it. Eh? <laughs> When a woman looks at a child and says, this is my child, that's a statement of fact. When a man looks at a child and says, this is my child, that's a statement of faith. <laughs> fact versus faith. I ain't going to know that. That's just a joke, eh? <laughs> oh boy <laughs> but we got to get rid of this entitlement re uh, mentality all over the Bahamas you know because we've had tourism for so long Cuba opening up soon let me just tell you <laughs> uh, because we've had tourism for so long and tourism money is easy we feel entitled but how are you growing and developing